it is indeed a joy to uh, be with you all uh, at this convention and to um, have this opportunity to share uh, some of the um, some of the admonitions and some of the help that we get in the scriptures. Our subject this evening has to do with the peace of God, but it has to do more specifically with one of the chief inhibitors of our having the peace of God, and that is anxiety. We'd like to read Philippians 4, 6, which is the verse just before the uh, seventh verse, which speaks of the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Verse 6 reads, and this is from the RVIC, in nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, we're going to discuss this subject, Brother Tim and I, but before we have the discussion part of our uh, service, we're going to each focus on causes and antidotes for anxiety. And I get the, the privilege of, of talking about the negative. I'm going to uh, focus on some of the causes of anxiety. Brother Tim is going to talk for a few minutes on the antidotes, and then we're going to engage in some discussion uh, together, Brother Tim Malinowski and myself. The dictionary defines anxiety as the mind and body's reaction to stressful, dangerous, or unfamiliar situations. It is the sense of uneasiness, distress, or even dread that one might feel before a significant event. Now, I think it's safe to say that we all have some levels of anxiety once in a while. Hopefully most of it is momentarily or short-lived, but it is not always the case. You know, we live in a world filled with anxiety for many different reasons. And since we are not perfect, uh, we cannot always escape various forms of anxiety. So our goal in this service is to look at both some of the causes and the antidotes so that we can minimize or at least mitigate the anxiety that might come into our lives from time to time. Now, the causes of anxiety can be many different things. And we're going to discuss the causes of anxiety for just a few moments on two different levels. The first level, we call this the surface level. These are This is anxiety that can just come as a result of the day-to-day -day experiences of life. And many of these are just you know, just kind of temporary or momentary anxieties, but some of them uh, can last for a long time if, if we allow them to. And we're going to just list these for now. We're not going to elaborate on them to any extent. We'll save that for uh, the discussion part of our session tonight. We're going to talk about uh, or mention 10 surface causes of anxiety. Number one, and one of the most common for many of us, job stress, the stress of dealing with people, with coworkers, with clients, with superiors, with those who may be under us, uh, being overworked. And the, the great uh, anxiety creator that I remember, deadlines, 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 deadlines. A second cause of anxiety on the surface can be just our personal finances. You know, there were perhaps times in our uh, earlier lives or maybe in our present lives for some where we kind of manage things from paycheck to paycheck and this can bring a level of stress or even anxiety into one's life. Number three, home responsibilities, uh, taking care of the home, maintaining it uh, so that uh, our, our families and our children uh, are brought up in, in an environment that is safe and that is uh, conducive to, uh, to happiness and to their growth. Number four, health issues. These can be issues of health with ourself, with our spouse, our children, our parents. And uh, to go along with this is uh, the aging process, the aging process that we each are going through, or perhaps in those uh, close to us, uh, perhaps our parents are growing through. And these going through. These can particularly be challenging and stressful and can cause a, a level of anxiety at times to, to infiltrate our mind. Another big one, number five uh, in today's environment, 
is raising a children, or raising a family rather in such challenging times. Um, our children, our grandchildren today are in a lot of ways innocently caught in the middle of, of common things or too common of things such as violence or parental and family dysfunction, uh, racial and social conflict, uh, school curriculums, which are questionable at best and which focus on non-biblical standards, which we know are not according to God's uh, arrangements. Um, the next uh, cause of anxiety could be just challenges in the Lord's service. We all have a great desire to be more and more involved in the service of the Lord, the ecclesia activities, conventions, service and witnessing opportunities in various ways. And even these can bring a, a level of anxiety at times when we, again, perhaps are uh, trying to manage deadlines, even in these capacities, or prioritizing our activities or the projects that we may be working on. Relationships with our brethren can unfortunately sometimes lead to a level of anxiety. You know, the apostles and even the brethren at that time in the early church had difficulties and it brought, uh, we believe, some anxiety at times to them. We also know that after Brother Russell died and the, the various uh, trials that occurred to the church then uh, brought about, I'm sure, a level of anxiety. And, and perhaps we have all been through situations with brethren that have brought some measure, at least, of anxiety to us, even if only temporary. Another, uh, the eighth one that we want to mention is our own personal mistakes and shortcomings. You know, do we ever become anxious or get discouraged because we seem to make the same mistakes over and over again? This can be perhaps a cause for some anxiety. One of the most obvious, number nine, is world conditions at the present time, human suffering in general. You know, we cringe at what the world is going through around us, whether it be political, social, economic, religious, morally. And even though we know the solution, which is our Lord's kingdom, it can be so easy at times to become anxious with regard to the world's current situation. And the last one of these surface anxieties we want to mention may seem a little unusual, but it's actually one that I have experienced. And that is what we call imaginary anxiety. You know, a situation perhaps weighs on our mind. Uh, we then maybe worry about it. And we start imagining things that could go wrong. Then anxiety creeps in and perhaps we become stressed out for, for a short time. Then the reality comes. And the situation that we were so worried about uh, turns out to be nothing at all, or at least nothing that should have caused anxiety on our part. So those are some of the surface anxieties, but there are also underlying causes, the root causes of anxiety. And those, as we will note, are much more spiritually focused. And we want to list seven of those underlying causes or root causes of anxiety. Number one, and perhaps the most common and basic underlying cause of anxiety is a lack of faith and trust in God. You know, lacking sufficient faith and trust that to remember and to always realize that he is guiding the outcome of all of our experiences according to his perfect will, as we read in the sentiments of Romans 8, 28. A second <clears throat> underlying cause of anxiety can be a deficiency in our prayer life. How can we unburden our cares, our anxieties, if we are not in communion with our Heavenly Father, who is the God of all grace, the scriptures tell us, and with Jesus, the great burden bearer and our shepherd? Number three, perhaps we are not using all of the available helps and supports that we have, whether they be the scriptures, the brethren, or even our own past experiences, but maybe thinking or feeling that Everything in life is completely on our shoulders, yet we have these support mechanisms available, but if we don't use them, anxiety can most assuredly gain a foothold in us. Number four, we could also have a lack of confidence, not lack of confidence in ourselves, but a lack of confidence in the Lord, which could result in an inability for us to make good and logical uh, decisions in life. You know, 
we again point back to Romans 8, 28 and re realize that all things work together for good, but we do need to make reasoned out, firm decisions in our life and rely on our confidence in the Heavenly Father to overrule these aspects of our walk. Number five, and a critical one is especially today, is the inability perhaps to keep a proper spiritual perspective regarding our experiences and those of the world. What is our long-term view of things? Do we only see the present troubles and distresses of our own experiences and those of the world? That surely will bring us distress and anxiety. Number six, what is our overall attitude? If our overall attitude is, is sort of like the saying, the glass is half empty instead of half full, you know, that's sort of viewing our experiences in a negative light versus viewing them in the positive light of God's providences and his overruling. So this really relates to our perspective, but this attitude of being positive rather than being negative is very important for us to consider. And then the last underlying cause, which sort of sums up all of these, is that of the wrong type of fear, slavish fear rather than rever reverential fear. And we know that slavish fear will never lead us to the peace of God, which is in Philippian, mentioned in Philippians 4, 7. Do we fear our job situation, our health, our relationship with our brethren? Do we fear making decisions? Do we fear the conditions of the world? You know, the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 4, 18, fear hath torment. It paralyzes us, and we cannot function, especially spiritually. Well, these are some, perhaps, of the causes, both the surface causes and the underlying causes of anxiety. But thankfully, thankfully, there are antidotes to these and perhaps other causes of anxiety. And so now we're going to ask our dear brother Tim to speak to us on some of these antidotes. Brother Tim. Can you hear me okay, Brother Stephen? Yes. Good. Thank you very much. Brother Stephen, dear friends, certainly a privilege to be with you. And uh, Brother Stephen, all of those uh, uh, trials that you provided or, or provided, I can certainly relate with. I, I gave the service, as you know, uh, a year ago on the peace of God. And so it's it's been a blessing for me over the past year, but especially over in this study with you, uh, it's been a blessing to kind of relive or to look at that again more closely and it's almost a continuation or maybe even a prequel to what we discussed last year. So I appreciate this opportunity. So uh, let's, let's begin with regard to an antidote. And what's the definition of an antidote? Um, I, 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 it's a cure. It's a counteract to a poison. That's kind of the basis for the definition of an antidote. Uh, in the news, if you watch the news, you might see a lot that has to do with Narcan. It's a uh, pharmaceutical that is used for opioid addictions or overdose. So if, if someone has an opioid overdose, the uh, paramedic or the EMT, uh, perhaps with doctor's orders, will, will uh, administer Narcan. And that Narcan uh, renders the opioid uh, ineffective. It stops it. So maybe a little bit more practical for us uh, is relative to fear. When we have fear, what's the antidote? And a lot of times it's truth. If we apply truth, that fear will not have the same effect that it had before. Now, all of us know that God's kingdom, God's kingdom is the only and complete antidote for all anxiety that is currently in this current world. But being this side of the veil, what options do we have? What antidotes do we have? Well, the peace of God and I know that's, we'll cover that a little bit more detail, Brother Stephen, but the peace of God is the basis for any and all antidotes that we use. And that again is from Philippians 4, 7. But I also like the March 11th manna text. So when you have some time, go back and read that. So let's look at some antidotes uh, as we kind of work from our, our, our peace of God toolbox, so to speak. Everyone is different. All of us are, are different. Um, so we need to find out what what tool or what antidote works best for us 
when that ant when that anxiety arises. And I'm going to share with you just what has worked for me, and especially over perhaps the last three or four years, what I found to be a benefit and to be a blessing. Now, I do have to say that, um, you know, professional, medical, psychological, emotional help is always encouraged for any type of ongoing or reoccurring anxiety. So, you know, if we have a problem with, with a physical ailment, we'll go see a doctor. Likewise, if we have anxiety or emotional uh, issues, we should likewise see a, see a professional as well. So, but what I'm going to focus on is what has worked for me in the past and I still use. Like Brother Stephen, I'm going to kind of go through this relatively quickly. I will quote a few scriptures. Uh, I won't read them. I might refer to them. And also, um, this is coming from the New American Standard, anytime I, I, I refer to a scripture. But the first is relative to our general health. And, and what I mean with that is kind of an overall activity or, you know, prevention for the flesh uh, to help us when we do uh, uh, come in contact with anxieties. And the first is diet. You know, what we take into our body, we read in 1 Corinthians 10.31, 1 Corinthians 10.31, do all to the glory of God. So everything that we take in, everything that we do, everything that we think about should be to the glory of God. The second one is exercise. Exercise is 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. And that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, exercise as we go forward. Next is sleep. And I really like the verse in Psalm 4, 8. Psalm 4, 8, it says, I will both lay down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. And I especially appreciate Brother Joe Megas when he quoted or, or provided me with the thought. And it's the relationship between exercise and sleep, body and mind. When the spirit is tired, exercise the body. When the body is tired, exercise the mind. So I appreciate that from Brother Joe. The next is relative to our physical flesh. And a lot of times, dear friends, this has to do with when we're in, the, when we're in perhaps the worst phase of anxiety, possibly a, a, a panic attack, so to speak. So this is, this is kind of uh, something that I use or I work with to help me when perhaps I'm having a, a very uh, bad uh, time with anxiety. And the first one is breathing. Deep breathing positively triggers your nervous system to slow everything down. So if I find myself going into an anxious type of a situation, I will start this deep breathing to help me slow things down and focus on my on myself. Mindfulness, what I just talked about, Matthew 625, Matthew 625 helps us to be to be in the present meaning noticing or impacting change. And this is something that, again, I find very important for myself and I've done over the years. The third point in this category is pressure points, physical pressure points uh, applied to your body, either from someone else or by yourself. And Brother Owen Kindig, Brother Owen Kindig Sr., helped me uh, learn about this probably over 30 years ago. And it, it's been a big help to me uh, going to sleep and things like that. So I really appreciate uh, Brother Owen Kindig, uh, certainly for his, his guidance and direction, but, but this point in general. Um, now we're going to focus on the antidotes relative to our spiritual or our, our spirit being, our new creature. And of course, this is what's most important for all of us. And I think it has to do with regard to prayer. The first one is with regard regard to prayer, be instant in prayer. Uh, we read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. You know, when I'm, when I'm going into an anxious type of a situation, I will typically pray before, during, and after. And each prayer is different in that situation of anxiety. Um, we also need to pray for a greater measure of the Holy Spirit, and we need to pray for the peace of God. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Brother Stephen talked about changing our perspective. And I think something that I think about is how significant is this, meaning this situation that I'm going through, that I'm having anxious thoughts about or responding to something anxiously, how significant is this in relationship to God's plan? Where does that fit in? And typically that will bring me down 
very, very quickly. It's uh, almost a very um, uh, humbling situation. And we read that in Isaiah 55, 8, Isaiah 55, 8. You know, friends, we can always change our perspective. And I, I, I remember Brother Obi, a very simple lesson. He was explaining how he was listening to the radio one time and didn't like what he was listening to. And he simply changed the channel. So I think for us, a lot of times, that's what we need to do. If we don't like the perspective or the situation, let's think of, about God and his plans and his purposes and his promises. And we'll talk about that as well. Number three, I like to follow Jesus's admonition of living one day at a time, not what may or might happen, but what is happening. And we read about that in Matthew 6, 34, Matthew 6, 34. And I think Brother uh, Stephen brought that out very well. A lot of times we'll think on imaginary. It's what our mind is thinking, not what is actually happening to us that we focus on. And that's what drives the anxiety. Don't go over past mistakes. Number four, we've sinned. We've had problems. We've had difficulties. But we've prayed for forgiveness. And he forgave us. And we believe his word. And this is Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Number five is certainly the fellowship and the support of our brethren and family. We read that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Build up and edify one another. Last year, I was blessed when I shared my trials during my service with all of you. It was something very personal and it's something very difficult for me to share, but yet I did. And dear friends, I was and I still am blessed by having that opportunity. I think about my dad, Brother Tony Malinowski, and he taught me a trial, excuse me, a trial shared is a trial divided. A blessing shared is a blessing multiplied. I know he learned that from someone else, but I learned it from him, so I appreciate that. As Brother Stephen mentioned, we have to make decisions based on faith. And um, I'm not an engineer, but I work with a lot of engineers during my job. I'm in sales. But they often talk about root cause and corrective action. If there's a problem, they want to find the root cause and they want to apply a corrective action. Well, that's what we need to do. And the process that we use where I work, it's PDC, plan, do, check, plan, do, check. Uh, you make a plan, you do it, and you check it, and you repeat it. For me, I changed it around a little bit, and I said, pray, do, check. Pray, do, check. And that's certainly watch and pray, pray and watch. I think all of us can certainly relate to that. I like Proverbs 16.3, Proverbs 16.3, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Uh, number seven, um, our trials are worth millions. Sister Sunbaum, I've never met her, but I keep repeating that over and over in my mind. First Peter 4, 12 through 19. How important are our trials? I really appreciate Sister Joanna Christensen when she gave a testimony and she talked about how important these trials are. If we're to have the privilege and the opportunity to help world of mankind up that highway of holiness, are we making the most? Are we using the experiences that we're going for to build up? and to be prepared for that opportunity. So I appreciate that. Um, number eight, take time to count your blessings. I need to do that more and more. And it, it was interesting, This about a week ago, we went through a, to a, a Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh. He's an artist. I'm not an artistic person, but I really appreciated it because it was kind of a uh, immersion into his art. You'd walk into a room and you'd see the beautiful art. And what impressed me most was the beauty and chaos, what Vincent van Gogh was going through, and yet he could produce such beautiful pieces of art. And I, he had a quote, it said, find things beautiful as much as you can. Most people find too little beautiful. I really appreciate that. Number nine, keep busy to the work. We can only think of one thing at a time. And if we're thinking about something that's our Heavenly Father's plans and purposes, if we're doing work with our brethren to bring honor and glory to our Heavenly Father, that's what's going to preoccupy our mind. I like the verse of Proverbs 11.25, Proverbs 11.25, he who watereth will be watered. Um, number 10, 
love and understand those that have hurt you and vice versa. Matthew 5, 43 through 48, Matthew 5, 43 through 48. How often are we supposed to forgive? Seven times? No, seven times 70. Um, we were recently up in Glen Arbor, Northern Michigan. I encourage you to visit sometime. Uh, great place to be year round, but there was a new uh, bakery in town. This just happened a few days ago. Brother John Slavich told me that a window was broken in the front. Sure enough, I went down and uh, there was a sign. They, they left the window uh, broken. They kind of showed where it was and they put a sign up and it said, don't break windows, leave rocks on the ground. And I really appreciate that. All of us are sympathetic. We all have an appreciation of the uh, uh, Jewish people and, and their position, their standing. And I really appreciate that thought. And it helps me to understand. Um, let's spread peace whenever we have that opportunity. Romans 12, 18. Romans 12, 18. Be happy. Live positive. Let your light shine each and every day, every opportunity that we have. And that's Matthew 5, 16. I think of Paul and Silas singing in the bowels of prison, where they were and yet what they chose to do. We choose our perspective. We choose our attitude. It's up to us to be happy or sad. We should be the most happiest people on earth or in the group. I'm not there yet. I still have my challenges. I still have my difficulties, but I appreciate Brother Todd with his opening uh, discourse when he talked about let's show others what they're missing, that happiness. And finally, perhaps the most important to me is living God's promises. As Brother Larry McClellan taught me and showed me, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And for me, that's Romans 8.28. So, Brother Stephen, that's a kind of a whirlwind overview, a quick overview, but some of the antidotes that I use and have used and are currently using uh, the past three years or so. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Brother Stephen. Well, thank you, Brother Tim. And if we, yes, that's good. We got both of us on there. And, um, you know, we appreciate those thoughts. And we're going to, we're going to enter into just some discussion now uh, for the remaining time of our service. And just to, to introduce our discussion, you know, we, since we do have some level of anxiety from time to time, at least I think if we're, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, it is how we deal with it is what is so important. And, uh, and so, you know, that's really the focus of our, of our, of our thoughts this evening. Uh, you know, we want to be able to dismiss it uh, in our experiences and to try to prevent it from becoming a sort of a chronic problem in our life. Uh, you know, anxiety can be like any, any sickness that might come into our life. It can be dismissed quickly or it can become a chronic problem. So we want to make sure that anxiety, when it does happen, uh, can be dismissed quickly and not become chronic to us. So uh, perhaps you have a, an introductory um, a few words too before we go on to our next point, Brother Tim. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I, I really appreciate the way you laid it out. But for me, anxiety, just a few key points is, you know, in, in the Bible, Moses, Martha, Job, Jonah, Elijah, and David all had bouts, severe bouts with, with anxiety. Uh, Psalm 17, especially verse 8, with regard to David, keep me in the apple of thy eye, hide me under your wing. That's something that I think is just beautiful that he, he needed that. You know, anxiety, as you brought out, it's a gauge or it's an indicator of our ability of calmly acquiescing or accepting the trials that we go through. It's a, it's a good, uh, it shows our true condition. Um, you know, Brother Russell brings it out in the morning resolve when he said, I will neither murmur nor repine at what the Lord's providence may permit come what may. And I think for me, that's something I'm striving. I'm trying to get to that point. I have a lot of work to do, but it, it shows me just how serious or how difficult this situation with regard to anxiety is. And I think Brother Russell brought it out in reprint 5874, reprint 5874. He said, or he wrote, I should say, fear and anxiety are the most foes of our human family. They produce nervous exhaustion, and are very injurious to our health. And I think medical doctors today, I know every time I go in for a physical, my, med, my, my doctor says, how's your stress level? How's your anxiety? And um, I usually have a very good conversation with them about that. And, and, and finally, Brother Stephen is, you know, anxiety can range from minor to major. 
Um, and likewise, the antidote or how we treat it will be the same. You know, I personally have had a range of good anxiety. Just I was a little bit nervous before this service, uh, but I take that as good anxiety to almost crippling anxiety, meaning panic attacks, things like that. So that's, and, you know, my definition of anxiety is, is very similar to yours. Um, you know, uh, well, I don't know if you want to get into that yet, but basically, you know, being worried, being harassed, being overcharged. That's the thought that I have relative to anxiety. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, we want to read um, this Philippians chapter four, verse six from the Weymouth translation. In fact, we'll go ahead and read verse seven because verse seven goes right along with it. Uh, we read it uh, earlier, verse six from the RBIC. I'd like to read it from Weymouth. It says, do not be over anxious. And I, I was struck by that, that addition of the word over uh, to anxious because uh, as you said, there's, there's sort of can be different levels of anxiety. Do not be over anxious about anything. But by prayer and earnest pleading, together with thanksgiving, let your requests be unreservedly made known. I like that word unreservedly. Made known in the presence of God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all our powers of thought, will be a garrison to guide your hearts and minds in union with Christ Jesus. So I really like that translation. Weymouth you know, gives it some descriptive uh, language there that some of the other translations don't give. But uh, brother Tim, maybe you can. Um, you were you were talking about the definition. Well, we both talked about the definition of anxiety uh, in in the text itself here in in the Philippians four six. So, what do you perceive as as Paul's? What did he have in mind here when he used uh, this uh, Greek word that is used here? Nope, you're you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. I think okay. I think brother Stephen, you know, it has to it, at least gives me the thought of, of being overly careful, you know, meaning, and, and I think we still need to be, we still need to progress, we need to move forward in our daily dealings, but we should not let the uh, trials or difficulties overwhelm us and, and stop any other growth that we have. I think sometimes the anxiety that we have, it stifles our, our emotion, it stifles our growth, it stifles our love for the brethren and certainly for serving our Heavenly Father. And I think for me, that's the thought that I take away from, from Apostle Paul here. Yeah, yeah, th that's true. And, you know, I was thinking too about if we connect verse six with verse uh, seven here, Brother Tim, you know, verse six talks about the, the anxiety or being over anxious, but being anxious or over anxious, that doesn't lead to the peace of God, which is in the very next verse. In other words, these verses are connected together. So anxiety leads to fear if it's not overcome. And fear, of course, is really the opposite uh, uh, thought of peace. But not being anxious or not being over anxious can allow us then to go on to what the next verse talks about, and that is the peace of God that passes all understanding. Um, you know, we just have one, one scripture we'd like to read, and, and maybe you have one also uh, just in regard to this before we go on to our next uh, section here. Um, John 14, verse 27, we'd like to read, and I'd like to read it from uh, the Good News uh, Bible. This is John 14, 27. These were the words of our Lord uh, the night before he died to his disciples. He says, peace is what I leave with you. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. And um, I think, again, that, that, that presents what our Lord wanted his disciples to to hear especially in that time where i'm sure they had a lot of anxious thoughts going through their mind uh the night before jesus death um perhaps you might have another scripture that you'd like to add to that brother tim thank you brother stephen yeah i you know it's i consider it kind of a sister scripture but you know isaiah 26 3 isaiah 26 3 and that's from king james thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And so I think for me, as long as our mind is stayed on thee, because we trust 
with our Heavenly Father. And, and again, I think a lot of that has to do with our precious promises. But we will, we will gain or we will grow that peace of God. And I think that peace of God will help reduce um, to, to some extent or to, to a large extent that anxiety. Having that peace of God will certainly eliminate or can eliminate that anxiety that we have. Yeah, the just um, I'm not going to read it, but uh, there's a whole section of Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 25 to 34, that uh, you know is just a good is is a good foundation passage for any of us to use. Uh, which, of course, it concludes with the the statement: "Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you." Uh, these are good foundation scriptures. Uh, that we can all look at and study uh, periodically or as often as we feel the need to help combat and uh, reduce the anxiety in our life. I think we'll go on to our next section uh, now. And, um, you know, Brother Tim, and we can kind of go back and forth here a little bit. Uh, one of the things you mentioned in your opening comments was um, something that I hadn't really thought of, maybe because I'm getting older and I don't do enough of it, <laughs> and that is uh, physical exercise as, a, as an antidote. And uh, I hadn't really thought about that too much, uh, but maybe I should. Um, do you have any further comment on that you might want to give to us? Yeah, um, brother Stephen, it was it was interesting. I I snuck out this morning and I actually went for a swim. Just was I was feeling feeling a little bit anxious about today, and so I basically went out and uh, went for a, a quick swim, about a twenty or thirty minute swim. And and I find that while I exercise, um, my any kind of physical issues will will fade away. But maybe more importantly, what what comes to what comes to, kind of bubbles up in my mind. And we read that in Philippians 4, 8, you know, kind of what you talked about, thinking on these things. What's most important in our life? And I find, you know, while I'm exercising or going through um, physical activity, it helps me kind of clear my mind. And it helps me kind of focus on what's important. So I was thinking about this service. I was thinking about the friends. I was thinking about, you know, what's happening in Ukraine and the Polish brethren, things like that. So, so for me, that's a, that's a blessing relative to that physical exercise. So depending what, what you want to do or what you can do, I think any kind of physical activity will certainly help and benefit. Um, during COVID, for myself, I was able to go to the pool. They were still open and it helped me socialize a little bit, meaning meet, interact with other people. I was able to witness. Uh, there's still a couple of uh, uh, people that I, I see at the YMCA that we talk, we talk truth uh, on occasion. So again, I think that, that, that exercise, although physical, it certainly helps the spiritual mind. And I go back to Brother Joe Migas, you know, when when the mind is tired, exercise the body. When the body is tired, exercise the mind. That's that relationship that I find so important for myself. So. Well, you know, one of the things that uh, that we mentioned that I'll just comment uh, on a little further uh, is as far as, um, you know, that one of the causes of anxiety and that is just the conditions of the world uh, that are around us, and and we you know we don't need to go into a, a lengthy discussion about that. We 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 all know of the the situation that is in the world today and and how tenuous uh, things are. But you know we we have the ability, or we should have the ability to manage our discretionary time and what we're doing with it. Uh, you know, we have, we have basically two sources of news. We have what's on the television or on our phones, but then we have what's in the scriptures. And uh, the scriptures are what has the, uh, the good news, we'll say, the good tidings of great joy, the gospel message. And, um, you know, if we're spending, uh, you know, so many hours a day or so much of our day filling our, filling our minds with the news of this world, and we do want to watch, obviously, we don't want to uh, we want to see what's happening in the world and see how it might fulfill prophecy. Yet, 
um, to just fill ourselves with all of the troubles of the world doesn't do us any good at all. And in fact, as, as we've already mentioned, uh, really can lead to a lot of anxiety as we see this world. And we know that the solution to this is not going to be watching to see what the political leaders of the world come up with. It's going to look into be looking into the scriptures to see what the scriptures come up with. And we know that is that is the solution. And so, you know, how much better our time can be spent in uh, perhaps private study or reading or obviously attending meetings and in fellowship with our brethren and spending less time perhaps in listening to uh, uh, or burying ourselves in, in a lot of the things that are happening in the world. So, you know, we just, uh, we wanted to mention that. And uh, I think you had, uh, you had also mentioned something that really struck me because I happen to remember it um, from Sister Sunbaum. Uh, the trials are worth millions. And I think she added on to that, don't waste any. I do remember Sister Sunbaum. I was, I was about um, thirteen or fourteen when she when she died, and we many of us know the experiences of of that. But um, you know, just talk a little bit more about this trials are worth millions. This this concept that uh, is should be so important to us. Yeah, um, uh, Brother Stephen, I think that you know, relative to those trials. And again, I'll go back to Sister Joanna's comments about how they were fellowshipping and talking about the opportunity, the privilege of, of raising mankind uh, up the, whole, the highway of holiness and what a privilege it is. And I think sometimes for us, um, and it's not millions of dollars, I, I, I want to, and I, I kind of say that, I say that with a little bit of a smile on my face, but it's the millions of lives that we can perhaps have an, have an opportunity or potential to, to lift up and to assist if we're given that opportunity, we're given that privilege. So I think that's very, very important. And, and I also think, Brother Stephen, sometimes we have a tendency to kind of rush through those trials. We want to get out of it as quickly as we possibly can. And I think if we take the time to prayerfully consider what we're going through and why and look for the Lord's leadings and his education and his teachings in that lesson in that trial um, I think that's something that's that that we that we need to do because again as you said they're tailor-made and I think of uh, brother Edmund Jesuit and he gave a talk still I, I can still see it in my mind um, that spoked wheel and each trial is differently and it's tailor-made for each of us, and we sh and we need to take the time, not rush through it, but we need to learn the lesson and grow from that. So, hey, let me let me let me sneak in here something real real quick, brother Stephen. And yeah, um, you know, for for you and we were with brother brother uh, John and sister um, uh, Slavich, and they were telling me a little bit about your granddaughter. And I should say one of your granddaughters, and I think I, they were explaining you have six or seven, but, but you, know, you, you talked a little bit about raising family as a cause. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Well, yeah, we, we are blessed. Uh, we have two granddaughters and, and five grandsons, and uh, they are a, a tremendous blessing to us. And, and, um, and of course, we have our three children and their spouses. But yeah, the... the I don't envy my children in raising their own children uh, today. And, and our three, uh, our two daughters and our one daughter-in-law, they're all three teachers. And uh, so they, you know, they are in contact with uh, situations of uh, children with, you know, special needs or problems. Uh, they're in contact with parental issues and so forth. And just the whole issue of the school systems themselves, which, I think have changed a lot from the time that, uh, that you and I were in school, Brother Tim, and I probably go back a little further than you. But, you know, the, there's a huge challenge, mostly on the parents' side, I think, but also the children in trying to, you know, we're, we're in the world, but not of the world. And that's, I think that's really hard. It's easier for adults, I think, because we, we've have hopefully have learned to mature and are able to sort of weed out things from our mind uh, in the world that we know we should reject. But for, for children who are just learning, you know, they're like a sieve. They soak up everything and they sometimes they can soak up the wrong things. And 
so as parents or grandparents or or even brethren in in the ecclesia it's it's i think we have a responsibility and a privilege to be uh, of support to be of help to to give a word of encouragement to both uh, our parents uh, of children and to the children themselves make them a vital part of our fellowship and uh, to at least in some way perhaps help reduce their stress and anxiety levels in in raising a family we're going to go on now to uh, another section of our of our uh, of our discussion and i see we're down to the last uh, seven or eight minutes here and uh brother tim Tell us a little bit more about prayer. Prayer is so important as an antidote. Maybe just give us a few more comments about prayer. And uh, unmute. Yep, thanks. <laughs> Sorry go. about that. You know, I, I, for me, I, I really think 1 Peter 5, 7, King James, cast 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So it, it's important for us to make those petitions known to our Heavenly Father. Prayer is so intimate, it's so powerful, and it's, it's such a privilege. And, you know, I was thinking, um, and I forget the verse, I apologize, that he will help us with the right thing to say at the right time. Um, I'm sure I'll get a, a, a note here from somebody. But um, when I had the privilege of, of providing a service for my, uh, for my dear um, father-in-law, Brother Richard Anderson, I was nervous. It was the first funeral service that I provided. It was the first memorial service that I provided. Uh, we had everything written out. I went over it. And, but I was nervous. And I had, I had anxiety. Uh, Sister Elva was there. Her family was there. And I just, I remember praying to our Heavenly Father to ask for assistance and guidance and help that he would help me deliver the right message and also the proper message. And, you know, Brother Stephen, I remember just kind of starting it. And, and it's like, I forgot it. I mean, I shouldn't say forgot it, but it just, it just went. I mean, it, 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 it was a beautiful service everything went well. And I think for me, prayer is so critical. And we, we pray for, for our Heavenly Father's will to be done. We ask for his guidance. We ask for his direction. And we need to accept that. And when we're given those opportunities, when he does reply to us, we need to follow through. It's a, it's a, it's a two-way conversation. We ask for something he, in, in his time, he'll provide it. But we need to keep an eye open for that response. And when that door is open, we need to move through it. So that's my thought on prayer, Brother Steve. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of jump in here real quick. You know, you talked a little bit about, you know, support uh, of your, of, of the children, of the family and things like that. Can you build upon a little bit more? We both talked about the fellowship and the support of our brethren. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How, how we need to focus on that, please? Yeah, I think we, you know, we have probably the greatest support group that anyone could have uh, in this present, uh, at this present time, because, and, and, you know, this does not mean that there are not times when, in special circumstances where perhaps professional help is needed by an individual or even a family, but generally in most of our experiences of life, I think our support can come from really I like to think of, you know, three or four different areas. They can certainly come from uh, our prayer life with the Lord, from our studying of the scriptures and looking to the scriptures, looking to the examples that are there, uh, looking to the fellowship of our brethren and the help of, that they are to us. You know, we have testimony meetings every week in our ecclesia, and those are a huge help to the rest of us. To, by seeing and hearing of the experiences of our brethren, uh, that is a great support to us and a help to us when we may go through similar experiences. And then, you know, this, the support of even just looking back on our own experiences and seeing how the Lord has led us. The Lord, there's a hymn that says, looking back, I'll praise the way how God has led me day by day or words to that effect. So, you know, we, ha we have a huge uh, group, you know, even at this convention, we have a, a support group of two or 300 brethren that, that are here to help and encourage one another. Um, I want you to just, uh, before we go to our last point here, uh, Brother Tim, 
one of the things we both talked about uh, to some extent is proper perspective. And uh, perhaps you can conclude this part before we get into some final thoughts uh, about our proper perspective with regard to combating anxiety. And, and I think, I think, Brother Stephen, that's um, that perspective is really God's perspective, His plan, His purposes. We've we we talked about the trials, what that what that's uh, what that means to us in our lives. I think you know, for ourselves, we really need to take care of ourselves. We're we're trying to make our calling and election sure. We need to build up. We need to take care of ourselves. Um, if we're if we're elders or deacons or servants in the class, we need to take advantage of of, of what's available to us and do our best in the service in a loving and humble manner. I think relative to the brethren, we really need to build up one another. We need to edify one another. And someone taught me one, one time, and, and that is to look at brethren the way our Heavenly Father looks at them uh, from a new creature standpoint. And that's the perspective that we need to have. We're all going to have failings. We're all going to have difficulties. We're all going to have trials, but we need to focus on those brethren. And I think we can apply the same thing globally as well. We have brethren on from Poland or around the world. We need to include those brethren as well as we go forward. So a, a, a brief answer, but uh, hopefully that suffices, Brother Stephen. Yes, and even as we view the world situation, we want to keep that in perspective too, realizing that their situation is going to improve in the Lord's time and in his way. And we look forward to that. Well, uh, Brother Tim, why don't you, uh, I know you had a couple of uh, two or three uh, little closing comments to make, uh, perhaps points to remember uh, from our discussion here. If you uh, go ahead and give us those before we draw to a close. Yeah, I know I, I had a I had a pretty big I had a pretty big load, uh, but again, it's it, it 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 all depends on the situation. So I, I've, I've learned a lot, but again, brethren, I have a long ways to go, and um, but but I, I see the Lord's dealing in my life in my family's life, and so I'm I'm gratefully appreciated to that. But you know, for me, like I said, exercise has been a has been a big part just to clear my mind, my my spiritual mind, and allow me to focus on on what. God has in plan or what he needs for me. But I, I can tell you, Brother Stephen, perhaps the most important uh, kit or the most important tool in, in God's, in God's uh, peace toolbox, and that's the promises, God's precious promises. And I'll, I'll leave you with 2 Peter 1, 4, 2 Peter 1, 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. And that, that, that's powerful, and it simply humbles me. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Thank how about you, Brother you, brothers, How about you, yeah. Brother Stephen? Any, can you, can, I, I mean, I kind of, I got the easy part. How about you? What are a couple of uh, uh, antidotes from your side, please? And then we'll close. Well, two, two things just quickly that just really stuck out, and, and you know, they're, they're all important because they all can help, but Trying to keep a positive attitude, I think, is, is so important. There's so much negativity in the world uh, on all levels, and, and that can infiltrate us. It's kind of like perspective, but just focusing on positive things, and that really means focusing on the spiritual things, focusing on what God has in store for mankind, what God has in store for us if we're faithful. And uh, so being positive versus viewing things always in a, in a negative light. And then the last thing is, is also something that I think you mentioned in your uh, previous comments, and that is keep busy. Keep busy, especially keeping busy in the Lord's service. If we, if we stay active in spiritual things to the extent that we have the time, you know, if we work, we obviously have to devote proper time to that. But in our discretionary time and how we use it, keep busy in the Lord's service and in spiritual things. Uh, we'll be much less inclined to uh, have a lot of unnecessary anxiety if we are actively engaged in the Lord's service. And just I'll just read one verse in regard to that. And this was the words of Jesus in John, the ninth chapter in verse four. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We haven't reached that yet. We may reach it, um, you know, time wise, but we may just reach it in our own life. So the more we can stay busy and focused on the Lord's work and his own work in us too, um, the less uh, apt anxiety is to infiltrate our life. So, so we thank uh, 
you, Brother Tim, and we're thankful to be able to have this discussion with you. And we're going to turn it back over to Brother Kent. Brother Kent.